Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first keynote session. Our speaker today is Professor Roger Dannenberg. Roger, it's great to have you here. I'm Gus, uh, your MC, and uh, we also have Zhu Yu Wang, our student volunteer head here as our tech host. The format of today's keynote will be about 40 minutes talk, followed by a 15 minutes or so Q&A. Uh, before it formally gets started, please just allow me to briefly introduce Roger and his research. Roger Dannenberg is professor of computer science, art, and music at Carnegie Mellon University, where he received a PhD in computer science in 1982. He is internationally known for his research in the field of computer music. He is the co-creator of Audacity, an audio editor that has been downloaded hundreds of millions of times. And his patents for computer accompaniment or the basis for smart music, which has been used by hundreds of thousands of music students. His current work includes live music performance with artificial musicians, automatic music composition, interactive media, and high-level languages for sound synthesis. Professor Dannenberg is also a professional trumpet player and a composer. He has performed in concert halls, ranging from the historic Apollo Theater in Harlem to the modern Espace du Pou Jackson at Ircom in Paris. Besides numerous compositions for musicians and interactive electronics, Dannenberg co-composed the opera, La Mala dos Pechos, with Jorge Sastre, and translated and produced the opera in English as The Mother of Fishes in Pittsburgh in 2020. Above all, Roger is an inspirational and fantastic advisor. His students get double advice on both science and music, plus free tickets for all kinds of great music. Everyone, please welcome Roger. All right, thank you very much, Gus. That was uh, <laughs> very kind of you. And I, I wanna thank uh, all of the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor. I'm going to try to share a screen here. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I, I wanted, the title of this talk is Learning to Perform. And I, that's what I wanna talk about, uh, music performance and a little bit of learning. And uh, we'll see where that takes us. Um, be, before I uh, really dive into that, here we go. Um, I wanted to just say a little more about who I am and, and how I came to be here. <laughs> um, first of all, when I was uh, very young, I studied music and math and was very interested in both directions. And in high school, I encountered uh, synthesizers that looked uh, actually exactly like, like this. I still remember it. And um, also encountered computers, which for younger people listening um, may be a little surprising that we didn't carry computers around in our back pockets when, when I was a kid. Um, so this was a real revelation to me. And I uh, went to college to study electrical engineering and computer science uh, so that I could build some of this stuff. And I designed and built my own uh, computer because they were pretty expensive uh, to have your own computer back then. And I also designed and built a, a kind of hybrid digital analog synthesizer that looked a lot like this. And uh, after some time in grad school, um, pursuing other, other directions in computer science, I eventually came back to, well, immediately after my PhD, came back to uh, work in computer music. And one of the first things I did was uh, computer accompaniment, which I'll talk about later. And uh, later my work led to Audacity, which I'm sure most uh, of you have heard about and Gus mentioned. And uh, recently I've been composing opera uh, along with a lot of other things. So that's sort of who I am. Um, 
to me, uh, computer music can be more or less um, uh, divided into three directions, or there have been three big aspirations in, in my view um, over the years from, from the very beginning and, and still until now. And the first of these directions is creating new sounds. And this was uh, especially true at the very beginnings, but still true today, uh, that building upon musical acoustics and our understanding of uh, digital signal processing, uh, computer musicians have been interested in making new sounds as well as recreating traditional sounds and maybe understanding them better. The, the second big direction and uh, I would say dream of computer music has to do with music representation and composition. We want to understand uh, to somehow mechanize and perhaps uh, explore new representations that are extending what it means to compose music. Uh, so it's more or less organization of, of sound. And then the third stream, I would say, is exploring performance, which is the focus of my talk today. So performance includes control and interaction, interpretation, um, music performance. Uh, so what I would like to talk about today is, uh, first of all, this idea that we have been taking um, uh, traditional views of instruments towards uh, much, a much richer view of uh, interactive music systems. And I'm going to assert that performance is the new frontier for research in computer music. It's also an old one, but, uh, and so I'm going to review some models of performance from the past. Then I'll talk about some performance challenges that we face now and some future possibilities. And I will finish up with a description of what I call a moonshot project or a, a very ambitious project of simulated musicians. So let's talk a, a bit about instruments. Uh, in instruments are, of course, a very ancient idea going back to Neolithic times, in fact. Uh, so we've seen uh, technology for hundreds or even thousands of years uh, being applied to instrument building. So it's really no surprise that modern instruments include computers and computation. And in fact, we've gone from instruments as acoustic and physical devices to, in some cases, entirely uh, software uh, devices, if you will. Um, one direction for instruments, given that we have computation now, is to build instruments that are, that are very complex and, and active. And I tried to get at some of these ideas with this picture of Max Matthews with his uh, radio drum or sequential drum uh, software that embeds the score into the instrument. And below uh, a picture of Mari Kimura uh, performing uh, with Eric Singer's guitar bot. Uh, for me, and I, I've been interested in building these sort of computational performance systems, uh, whether you call it an instrument or a com just com plain computer music system or what. Um, and, and for me, this uh, computation offers some really interesting possibilities for uh, composers and performers and, and really can change what it means to be a composer. Uh, this little diagram is supposed to uh, help to illustrate this idea that as a composer, we can build an interactive computer music system. And uh, what do we do with that system? Well, we embed a lot of uh, compositional ideas and uh, musical imperatives that uh, that we feel are important as a composer. And th those ideas and that computation, those algorithms uh, shape whatever the 
the system does. So a performer can interact with the system in various ways, but what comes out is, is shaped by what the composer decides should happen. And of course, then sound comes out of the system and the performer is listening to the sound. So as the performer works with that system, uh, the performer is going to adapt to, to make the most of it. And the best way to adapt will be to conform to some ideas that the composer put in there to begin with. Um, so this is in some ways like music notation because the composer is sort of giving ideas and direction to the performer, but it's not a, a specific note level or a, a very uh, linear sequential kind of direction to the performer. It's, it's leaving a lot of things, a, a lot more things open to the performer than we would expect in a traditional musical score. And so this idea of kind of extending the idea of, of instrument and the idea of score and the role of the composer and the role of the performer and, and taking these all in a new direction through computation is uh, to me one of the most important contributions or the greatest, one of the greatest contributions of uh, computer music to the field of music in general. Um, so I've, I've talked about instruments and uh, I, for the nine, uh, audience, I don't think there's, uh, th there's nothing shocking about this, but um, I, I want to make the point that we've seen a, a real expansion of the concept of instrument. And I, I tried to illustrate that with this little diagram on the left, where uh, I've, I've used the word interactive system instead of instrument. And we see not just a person controlling a thing and the thing making sound, but we have perhaps two people uh, uh, interacting with a system or one person interacting with two systems. We have systems interacting with each other and all of this producing sounds. So we're, we're building uh, much more complex systems, or at least we have the potential to build more complex systems. So, uh, I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, in fact, I'll sum it up here and say that computation is blurring any distinction between instruments and performers. And an important direction for NIME is intelligent interactive performance systems. So this includes artificial performers, orchestras, robots, and, and so on. Um, not that these are totally new to uh, anyone who's, who's been to recent NIME conferences, but I, I think it's important to emphasize this direction. So if we're going to think about performance, um, it's, it's good to ask, you know, what do we really know about performance? In the same way that if we're going to use computers to make musical sounds, then the first thing we might do is um, say, what do we know about musical acoustics? And what do we know about signal processing? And how can all of this past knowledge be used to help create uh, interesting new artifacts in the future? And, and similarly, we have uh, centuries of uh, music theory and, and ideas about composition to build on if we want to build, if we want to explore composition with computers. And so if we're going to explore performance with computers, we ought to take a look back and, and ask, you know, what do we even know about performance? Well, I've listed some things here and I've, I've tried to give credit to some of the pioneers. And of course there, are, you know, I'm talking about a huge body of work and many, many researchers. So I apologize to anyone that I left out, but uh, let's talk about, first of all, the area of expressive timing uh, what do we know about timing? Well, we know, for example, that timing is influenced by music structure. We know that timing uh, can be used to express emotion and uh, is, is correlated with, with emotion. We know that timing can be tied in part to uh, the, just the mechanics of 
instrumentalists uh, using their muscles and interacting with physical devices. And we know that there's some, some randomness or some um, indeterminacy due to uh, motor noise and the, the human nervous system and to um, uh, randomness in, in instrument uh, behavior. Uh, so those are those are some of the you know some of the key findings, and of course there's a rich literature behind each one of these things. Uh, the second area is emotion. Performers um, understand a lot about emotion and expressing emotion. Um, we've learned from scientific studies that uh, emotion has a, a number of cues in music, and these include. Uh, things like tempo and pitch height, uh, the steadiness of tempo, uh, dynamics, articulation, and, and so on. And there are some very interesting studies about uh, detecting emotion, about generating emotion or uh, communicating emotion uh, through, through music. Uh, a third area is entrainment. And this uh, basically means um, uh, playing beats or finding, finding the beat, tapping your foot or synchronizing with another player on the basis of beats. And uh, the, there's a good overview in a recent publication by Clayton et al. Um, it's, there's a huge body of work here as well. And one thing I can say about entrainment, uh, as opposed to expressive timing and emotion where I can point to specific things that we've really uh, learned and we can show experimentally. I think entrainment is something that we, uh, we can measure, but we don't really understand mechanisms. We have, we have lots of mechanisms that don't really work very well. And uh, it seems that there's such a gap between what we can do with computers and what humans can do uh, that, uh, you know, it, it points to our lack of understanding. And then finally, uh, we can talk about improvisation or stylistic interpretation. Uh, this is important, especially important in non-Western classical music. You know, in, in classical music, um, you're usually uh, or conventionally given a score full of notes and timing and uh, so, uh, it's pretty specific about what you're supposed to play. In popular music forms, so that includes rock and jazz, uh, folk music, church music, many, many other forms, um, the music consists of a uh, sort of a skeleton or a structure, uh, but performers are expected to fill in. So a drummer is going to uh, make up uh, a beat and, and drum fills, a uh, guitar player is probably going to uh, make up strumming patterns and rhythms and chord voicings and so on. And, and so all of this, it's understood that all of this involves some improvisation and uh, some performance in keeping with, with a, a conventional style of which there are many. Um, so we have a lot of examples of, of machines that do things like this but no real general theory about um, how it is that we um, manage different styles or identify styles or, or generate them and, and so on. So if, if we step back and say, well, okay, we know all of this about performance, um, how much of, of what we know about performance actually gets um, incorporated into systems that we build? And I would say, uh, it's sort of like this. It's practically none of the knowledge that we have is uh, making it into actual implementations or systems that we perform with. The one exception possibly being uh, improvisation and stylistic interpretation. Um, uh, but in that case, it's almost always uh, a single specific style is modeled and is the basis for uh, an interactive system or an instrument or a piece of music. Um, so we're not actually, you know, we have no general theory and we, we don't build systems that can just um, adapt to a wide variety of 
performance styles. Well, so th this is something about what we what we know about performance. Um, research in performance has largely uh, been related to uh, building models of different types of performance. So I, I'm, I'd like to present some examples because this is what I've spent a lot, a large part of my career doing and working on. And one of these areas is improvisation. Um, I point to Joel Chatterby and George Lewis as some of the pioneers. And of course, there are many, many others. I, I'd like to play, uh, just to give an idea of what I'm talking about, I'll play a short excerpt from a, a piece I wrote uh, called Nightly News. Um, let's just play it here. So the idea here was there were um, uh, several sort of artificial performers that are uh, listening to my trumpet and trying to extract some information about tempo and activity levels and uh, building pitch histograms to model uh, pitch directions and uh, and and there's you know some other other things going on including some signal processing. Uh, the next example, whoops, <laughs> sorry. Let's, here we go. The next example uh, I'd like to show is a very different model. Uh, it's one of more uh, classical or chamber music um, that I've, I called computer accompaniment. It, there are some different terms uh, for this approach, but the idea is that you've got a more or less conventional score, uh, one part for a soloist to play, one part for an accompanist. Usually the soloist uh, is the human and the accompanist is the computer. And uh, we want the computer to uh, pay attention to the soloist, listen to the human and synchronize with them and play along, uh, play a, a given score uh, along with that performer. And so this example is a vocal accompaniment system that was uh, built by Lauren Grubb for his uh, CMU PhD thesis. Uh, this is from 1998, and this is um, possibly the first uh, 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 accompaniment system using machine learning and uh, some uh, statistical methods. And um, uh, let's let's hear some of this. And if you listen closely, uh, you can you'll hear that the singer um, is uh, when when she gets to the the more technical part is in, uh, deliberately actually uh, slowing down just a bit, and and then later she she speeds up. It's it's subtle, but definitely the the system is following her. I think it stopped before she sped up. But anyway, let's let's move on. Uh, we have a lot of examples to get through. Um, another way to think about uh, performance and interaction is the conducting model, where uh, a human, where the, where the computer is not listening to a performer and following along in a score, but the computer somehow is getting is directly being told uh, where the beats are and is 
uh, deducing tempo and maybe other information from that. Uh, this was um, uh, had a, a number of researchers, particularly from Japan. Uh, and so I'd say some of the pioneers of computer conducting were Oteru, Katayose, Morita, Hashimoto. And uh, this, this was uh, a, a lot of work was done in the early 90s. Um, I'm going to give an example uh, from my work. This is uh, much later, actually 2010. And rather than uh, thinking about conducting as a, uh, you know, something you do with waving a stick as a baton and uh, sensing the baton, uh, the system we're using is uh, foot tapping, but it's essentially a, a different kind of uh, conducting. And in this performance, uh, we have a, the computer is playing the role of a string orchestra and those eight speakers you can see in the back are playing about uh, 20 tracks of strings. The computer is, is speeding up and slowing down to match the tempo of the foot tapper. And it's also taking cues so that it, it you know, not only comes in at the right tempo, but at the right time. So we'll, we'll play a, a few bits of this. So just to pause for a second. So just in case it's not clear, the uh, there's a, a live uh, upright bass player on the left part of the screen. I know that the video is not real high resolution and who knows what's coming through Zoom, but uh, uh, that's the soloist as it, as it were. Um, the, uh, actually, I think I can point, uh, uh, the, the woman right in the middle here is tapping her foot. She's uh, uh, normally a percussionist, a vib vibraphonist with the band, but uh, her role here is, is foot tapping. And, uh, and uh, the high, you could particularly hear the, the high strings. I'll play a little bit more. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to a section. I think we can get more of the band in here.
Uh, so a very, uh, I think, seamless integration of, of the computer parts, which sounds very natural and, and live players. I'm going to jump to the big finish at the end just because I, I like it. <laughs> so let's see here. I think that should do it. So I wanted uh, to just emphasize there's no click track here in the sense of a bunch of players uh, uh, with headphones following a, a metronome. Uh, there's, it's, it's pretty fluid and the band, you know, when the band gets excited and picks the tempo up a little bit, it's all okay because uh, they can, you know, go with their musical sense and the computer can follow them. Uh, okay, uh, next up, uh, let's talk about a different uh, uh, kind of level of performance at a much lower level, uh, talking about individual performers and how do they get from, uh, from notes and particu in particular symbols in, a, in music notation to musical sound. And, you know, the conventional answer for, uh, for decades, uh, maybe, you know, from the very beginning of computer music has been, well, let's figure out how to synthesize a note. And then if you want to play a piece, that's just a sequence of notes. So we'll just splice together a sequence of sounds and we're done with it. And um, this was a big mistake uh, uh, that's been, been propagated through um, uh, note-oriented music representations uh, in software uh, into MIDI and uh, which is a very note-oriented uh, and, and to sampling synthesizers which are all based on recording individual notes and and the whole thing is just uh, uh, to my mind is is really a big mistake based on a just an engineering misconception that you can decompose music into into notes and then uh, solve the note problem and put it back together. Um, what I've learned in in my research and in trying to make uh, good sounding synthesized performances is that um, the the sound of a note depends very much on context. So. If, if you don't take context and phrasing into account, um, synthesizer, I mean, even, even good sounding notes do not sound like real musical instruments because musical instruments are always played in, in phrases. Uh, so rather than belabor this further, I just wanna show, play an example. This is from uh, Ning Hu's PhD thesis, uh, another advisee of, of mine and uh, the system, her thesis was basically automating uh, some, some things that we had done in the past by hand. So this is a, a completely automated system that you, you just, you start with some music and you get a, a musician to record the music, uh, perform it musically, and then you feed the music and the recordings into this uh, learning system. And it produces, first of all, an instrument model that's shown on the bottom here. Uh, that's basically a mapping from uh, control signals into spectrum. So it's kind of a spectral synthesis model, uh, but it also has some uh, ability to model attacks, the inharmonic attacks and, and kind of noisy attacks uh, to make things sound even better. So it automatically builds this model. And then it, uh, it also learns a performance model, which tells how to go from symbolic scores uh, in a machine readable form, how to go from this symbolic form, note level form into continuous control functions that drive the instrument model through entire phrases. Uh, so that every, every envelope, every vibrato, uh, every uh, pitch deviation is all um, uh, determined at the at the phrase level and in context. 
so let's let's listen to uh, this is a, a learned bassoon synthesizer. Um, it's not perfect, but it's uh, I think it sounds very musical. And uh, this is a bassoon playing a piece of music that it's never seen before. Uh, it, was, it was trained on other examples, but but nothing uh, nothing was tweaked here. Another problem in performance is list, is the listening problem. We, we can't really build good musical performers if they don't know how to listen to music. And one of the challenges in uh, improvisational systems is listening a, at a higher level than kind of the note level or the feature level of features of attack times, durations, pitch. Uh, this is some work uh, that I did with Belinda Tom and David Watson on uh, trying to get a computer to understand different improvisational styles. Now, there, there's nothing um, uh, predetermined about, or, or, or there's nothing absolute about these different musical styles. Uh, the, the idea is that whatever the performer wants to do, uh, if the performer can play in some different styles and produce examples, we can use machine learning to learn to identify those, those different musical directions. Uh, so I'd like to play a little example of this uh, music classifier. Um, and by the way, it's, it's uh, operating on the previous five seconds. So it, it takes, sometimes there's a little bit of latency to detect um, when the style has changed. And eventually, it will detect rest, which it always gets right. Uh, I, I'll I'll show you a bit of uh, what the what was driving the research was trying to create a, a piece that would um, uh, sort of go into different interactive styles according to uh, what I was what I was playing. And um, so I'll, I'll play a bit of this, and I've annotated these excerpts with what I was doing and what the computer was, was detecting. So here we go. Bye. 
And that was uh, the animations that was a collaboration with Scott Draves. Um, uh, and, and hopefully it was clear the, the uh, uh, visual stuff was, was all parameterized and, and coupled to the music generation. Um, anyway, um, let's talk about uh, one of the challenges of uh, interactive music systems and getting computers and people to play together, at least in um, music with a, with a beat or music with a tempo is, um, well, there are, there are several challenges. Uh, one of them is the state of the art in beat tracking uh, really leaves a lot to be desired. Um, today, excellent performance is, uh, um, or the, 90% uh, is considered excellent performance. Uh, so, you know, 90%, uh, maybe that's good for a researcher, but should, should we uh, not expect to get through 32 bars without, you know, losing time, losing the beat? Um, another problem is music structure. Uh, can machines hear the form? Uh, we, we have a big advantage if we write interactive sort of free uh, pieces, it's, it's, a, it's a modern thing to do and it, it's, um, I, I have nothing against it, but it kind of avoids one of the big listening problems, which is uh, if I wanna play 12 bar blues with a computer, the computer better know where the 12 bar form is. An another problem, you know, I mentioned style and arrangement before. So when humans get together and play, it's, uh, uh, common to ask the drummer, you know, can you play more of a shuffle or to tell the, the pianist, uh, give me four bars up front and I'll come in. Or to the whole band, you say, let's, let's have an eight bar intro. We'll do a vocal sax solo to the bridge and then take it out. Okay, that uh, is, is a very high level description of the whole form of a piece that musicians can understand and work with. And of course, also listen to each other and hear the form and, and know what's going on. But we don't know how to build performance systems that do this. Well, so that's that we have, we have big challenges. I, I'd like to uh, just as an aside, uh, talk about um, sort of how things develop. And sometimes we kind of lose perspective, lose historical perspective or uh, uh, over long time spans. And it sometimes it helps me to think about this example. This is a picture, typical picture of an early electronic uh, music system from uh, a, a radio studio and so what do we have today? Well, this has all been replaced by uh, kind of off the shelf equipment, standard interconnections, uh, lots of integration. We've got, you know, electric guitars even that have standard quarter inch high impedance outputs that plug right into effects boxes um, and on and on. So now we have systems that rather than requiring an, an electrical engineer and a technician to set up and maintain, uh, we have equipment that rock musicians can go out and and buy um, at a local store, uh, put it together on stage, and have something that's actually much more sophisticated than uh, some of the uh, early uh, custom-built, very expensive studios. Uh, similarly, I think we can envision this happening in software in the future. It hasn't really happened yet. This is the uh, Canadian Electronic Ensemble uh, set up uh, for a performance and you see a variety of uh, computers and wires and cables hanging out everywhere and, and some, uh, synthesizers and mixers and devices. Uh, and it's all kind of uh, patched together. 
Um, but what might this look like in the future? I mean, imagine a, a application in some future popular music. Um, if this were a run in, run in the mill uh, performance, uh, imagine that uh, musicians just show up with software, uh, maybe a smart drummer and an artificially intelligent horn section and automated strings and a virtual bass player and um, all tied together by something I've labeled human computer music performance control system. So if we had all the right standards um, and, and we really solved a lot of the, the problems I've been talking about, we can begin to envision a, a future where music performance with computers is, is a really different uh, thing. <laughs> um, okay, so I'd, I'd like to uh, finish up with uh, discussion of this moonshot project. So the, the idea of a moonshot project is like sending a man to the moon uh, uh, is, is almost har hard to even imagine uh, accomplishing. And it's, it's a project where in order to accomplish it, you, you have to solve a whole variety of problems in many different areas and bring everything together. And, and the moonshot, a good moonshot project also has a very clear vision, a clear goal, you know, putting, putting a man on the moon and, and bringing him back uh, sort of catalyzed everyone's imagination and, and drove this in, incredible uh, project. So, so what's a good moonshot project for music and music performance? Well, this one was suggested to me and I think it's very interesting. I think it's actually a really great project. Uh, Jerry Garcia is dead and millions of fans miss him. Uh, Jerry Garcia was the uh, uh, lead guitarist for the Grateful Dead and um, more or less the, the leader of the group. And uh, so the question is, can we develop and apply artificial creative intelligence to fill the gap left behind by the passing of Jerry Garcia. And, you know, when you first ask that question, you think, oh, that seems impossible. Uh, but looking at what we have, there are five terabytes of concert recordings. It represents about 10,000 hours of recordings uh, from Grateful Dead performances. Um, so, the challenge is to build some kind of uh, machine learning and modeling of uh, from all of this data um, to uh, capture the, the the style and of Jerry Garcia, and and that's at every level. So the the sound of the guitar, the the fingering technique, the compositional direction, the the beat, the uh, improvisational ideas, the interaction with other performers. Uh, lots of things to, to study and learn there. And perhaps if we could build that model and combine it with some kind of human computer music performance, um, we could have a, a, a mix of live musicians and, um, and this artificial Jerry Garcia uh, perform once again. So I, I wanna wrap up now. I, I, we've come a long way with computer music and with performance. Interactive performance has transitioned from uh, technical research to artistic practice, and we'll hear lots of, of great interactive performances in this uh, conference. But we also have a long way to go. Understanding music performance, at least as well as music theory and uh, sound synthesis, uh, which are applied in other areas of computer music, is, uh, is something that we're lacking. We need to understand music performance better. And we need to move performance models and research into practice. Uh, we There's a lot of research out there, very little of it actually gets incorporated into systems that we build. And uh, we also obviously need advances in machine listening. Uh, things are things are progressing, but we have a long way to go. Um, and, and finally, I'll just say that I believe uh, expanding the notion of instrument and thinking about interactive performance systems and computation opens many new paths for scientific and artistic 
uh, research, especially for NIME. So Gus, hopefully Thank you've you. been monitoring questions and have some questions for me. Thank you, Roger. It's a great talk. The first question is from Alex. Thanks for your inspiring keynote. When we talk about interactive music systems, how do we determine if they are not just reacting to or accompanying the human performer? Is it really interactive then? Wouldn't it require to model musical creativity, which is another area which also very difficult to understand? Good question and very good point. Um, I think that uh, that the musical creativity comes at, at many different levels. And that's, that's one reason I tried to emphasize these different performance models and, and mentioned a couple of times this idea of, of um, improvisation and, and musical style, because you know, I, not every musician is is a is a composer or necessarily even a a great creative musician. You know, we all we all struggle and we try to be creative, but but um, uh, you can make a lot of music without being a a, a a super creative musician. But but you are creating at different levels. You're creating um, at at the articulation and phrasing level. Uh, you are you're creating in terms of just selecting, um, you know, from your knowledge of, of um, beats and patterns and chord voicings and other other techniques. So I, th I think all of these things come come to play. And so I think uh, I would agree uh, if if you if you claim that by and large we're building reactive systems and not interactive systems. Um, I would agree with you, but I think um, uh, that to the extent that we build systems that at least inject a little bit of surprise and and a little bit of um, uh, uh, you know kind of unanticipated reactions that the performer might respond to, then then we're we're getting at at least a little bit of creativity, and uh, we and we have a lot a long way to go. So. Uh, Certainly, you know, there's there's room for incorporating uh, not just stylistic generation, but but full out music composition into into performance systems in the future. Yeah, yeah, and indeed, you know, the the difference between react or respond or interaction is is not always a clear black and white. There's a full spectrum of it. I, you know, I mean, just from personal experience, I can, I can think of plenty of times when I was on the bandstand, just holding on for dear life, saying like, I have no idea what I'm, what I'm doing or what's happening here. And uh, um, I'm just trying not to make a fool out of myself, much less be creative. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes those are the best moments, but, uh, you know, you never know. But there's certainly a range. Yeah, that's that's when we fully give the intelligence to composer, and we are just you know the the machine. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is, how to move from technical to artistic practice, given evaluation metrics might not always align between practice and disciplines. Ah. Yes, evaluation is hard. Um, I, I think uh, one, one thing that I think about with, with evaluation of these systems is um, that uh, you, can, you can have objective evaluation in the sense that if you're, if you're building a model and you, you want the model to behave in certain ways, you can make predictions about what the model should do if it's operating in a musical way or what it should do if it's operating correctly and you can measure uh, whether that actually happens or not and and so um, you know in this early stage of research i think uh, you know maybe that's all we can do and uh, but i think if it's if it's interesting work that's that's good enough so for example with with the um, 
uh, style classification uh, work that I did, um, you know, whether that makes a, a good piece or not, who, who is to say? Um, but I can also measure that objectively and say, um, well, as a performer, if, um, you know, if, if somebody holds up a cue card and says, play frantic, and I play frantic, and then we look five seconds later to see if the computer says frantic, and if, if what the computer says matches what was on the cue card that got held up, then I successfully, you know, objectively conveyed uh, this style through music to the computer. And, and so, you know, that's an example of a, a really objective evaluation of a, a system that was really created for something much more subjective. So I don't know if that helps. I, I guess the answer is you have to be uh, creative about evaluation. And, and I would say, don't get too worked up about um, evaluation. And uh, especially now, I, I, I think there's an overemphasis on evaluation. I, I, I hate to, to say that, and maybe I'll get beat up for it, but I don't know. That's the advantage of giving a keynote. You can, you can be controversial, right? And, and so I, I think uh, to some extent, we're um, emphasizing evaluation to the detriment of real research, because I see a lot of people doing uh, uh, quick subjective evaluation, taking surveys and polls, and you read them, and it's really meaningless, and it, it can't be compared to anything else. So why do it in the first place? You know, it's it's better to just uh, do good work and good ideas, and and try them out. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Leons. Uh, thank you for a great presentation, Roger. Do you think it will be possible to develop the kind of systems you are proposing in your moonshot project without solving the hard AI problem, which oh. is general artificial intelligence? This is this is a great question. <laughs> yeah, great. And and hi, Michael. Thank you for the for the question. Um, I, I I think so. I I, I think that. Um, uh, well, I think that that really uh, working at at the level. I mean, so for example, creating a, a new um, uh, AI performer um, that's not Jerry Garcia and it's not Miles Davis and it's not Ravi Shankar, but it's it's some something equally uh, uh, great. I, I think maybe that does uh, is as hard as the general AI problem. Um, but, but I think uh, imitating sort of known styles and, and existing performers um, at, at least long enough for long enough to do a concert uh, is, is, is conceivable. So I hope so. But um, one, one thing I, I do think is that uh, we're, we're probably not gonna do it with deep neural networks. I, I, I was just writing to a, uh, a friend about this today that, um, you know, are deep networks and computers a threat to composers and musicians? And right now, I think um, what's, and, and, and from my own research, what I think is lacking in deep networks is um, kind of symbolic reasoning and the idea to um, think of a compositional concept or, or a musical construct and think about elaborating that construct. What, what deep networks and sequence models do seems to be, uh, you know, kind of generalizing and smoothing out over huge volumes of data and then uh, producing things that are um, uh, uh, somewhat, somewhat statistical and don't really have a, uh, a goal or an objective um, to satisfy in a, in a more symbolic sense. And I, I think that's a real shortcoming that um, we, we may have to solve that problem before we can go forward. Um, I think many, many people, especially people that haven't been in this field uh, for very long, you know, may look at uh, become real deep network devotees and think, oh, this is the solution to everything because that's kind of what they're taught. Right, and but if you if you look at the longer 
uh, trajectory of, of AI, um, you know, you, you can look back and, and see um, logic programs and then expert systems and then uh, neural nets and uh, uh, Bayesian reasoning and, and deep networks and so on. And it's just wave after wave of, of um, new concepts and every wave kind of like completely obliterates the past because it's such an improvement. And I, I think the next improvement might actually be someone figuring out how to do this more uh, symbolic uh, reasoning. And I, I'm, I'm sure it will be built on top of, of deep networks uh, or something similar to it, but, um, but it, it's, it's gonna be just a qualitative change. Yeah, thank you. It's so interesting, you know, that the topic for our next keynote or Yan Le Kun, his topic is so well aligned with yours and, and, and uh, uh, maybe through self-supervised learning, the cutting edge technology, um, we can do something differently. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to it and hope everyone will join me there. It's, it should be great. Did you two have a conversation before, you know, settling down the topic? It's, it's like so co coherent also. Okay. No, no, we didn't. <laughs> Subconsciously, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Next question is from Victor. Thanks for the informative keynote. I'm not an artist, so I see things as more of a collection of rules that make improvisation interesting. Can I know your understanding of how people differentiate a performer, play a wrong note with a performer, make an artistic variation in general? Where is the balance between rules and randomness? Really good question. And that's a big challenge. And um, I really don't think I have a good answer for that. I think that the, like the way musicians think about this is uh, they they think of music as like a language that if you're if you're playing a, a jazz solo in a, a bebop style let's say um, that that's a, a a real language and it's understood by musicians as a language and and so you know just like with a the language there are there are rules of grammar. And, and if you say something wrong, everyone knows it. Even those many times those rules of grammar are uh, really impossible to formulate. Um, uh, they, they just, they don't cover everything. And yet somehow we humans, uh, especially native speakers, uh, you know, just have an intuitive feel for, for our own language and, and we spot right and wrong. And that happens in music. So. So that's the real challenge is, you know, how do you, how do you make this intuition objective? And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what a lot of, of machine learning is about. And actually, I think that relates to what I just said about, um, you know, the, the, the next generation uh, that has a more symbolic uh, sort of uh, aspect to it um, could actually look at a note uh, choice or something and say, that's wrong. You know, right now, deep networks say, well, the probability is lower. But, you know, like musicians never say, well, I think that's unlikely to play that. It's like, that was a wrong note. It's, it's either OK or it's not OK, but it's very, very uh, categorical. Um, but, but, you know, how do you solve that? I, I think that's that's you know one of the big open questions for music and music modeling. So I, I can't I can't answer it. Yeah, great question. <clears throat> Thanks. And and I think it's maybe also related to the you know evaluation problem. You know, if if we truly know what is the difference between randomness and artistic variation, then we have inductive bias. Then if, if we have been done bias, then we can inject it probably into the deep learning model and they can do the correct thing. But, you know, it's, it's the same. It's the mm -hmm. two sides of the same point. Well, I've, I, and I've, I've tried to make the point to uh, uh, students and, and others that if you could, if you had a good evaluation function, then that would be the solution. 
because yeah. then music yeah. music generation would turn into a search problem to satisfy the objective function that you have. And, and the reason it's a problem, I mean, I mean, the reason music composition, music generation is so difficult is, is we don't, you know, we don't have rules to generate music and we don't have rules to evaluate music. Yeah. If the loss function could be well-defined, we're all done. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it could be a very hard, you know, NP complete yeah. search problem, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think especially with music when there are actually many, many different right things that you can do. Um, I, I, I would love to have this become a search problem. <laughs> uh, I don't see new questions popping up, but we still have, you know, several minutes, I think. I will just take the privilege and ask two questions for um, the attendees. Sure. Um, one is for you know maybe uh, young professors and uh, you know, PhD students. Is uh, you know in your talk and we see that through your career you did so many work on different aspects of computer music. You know, programming language, nine, music understanding, MIR, et cetera. And, you know, normally people can just touch upon one or two, even just with 20 years. And um, could you here share your secret ingredient on how to touch upon so many fields and still be so deep? Mm. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um... Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm, I'm the first thing that came to mind is um, uh, might might surprise you that uh, uh, music funding is well. This won't surprise anyone. Funding in in music is really difficult, and and so um, I've had many different ideas about you know good things to do. Um, that that I thought people might be interested in, and that industry might want to fund, or National Science Foundation, or someone might want to fund as as research, and uh, so to some extent, I've I've uh, uh, you know pursued ideas like computer accompaniment, and um, you know that that actually um, uh, was successful in 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 the sense that a whole company, uh, you know, was was founded and is, is still in business today. Uh, but it didn't actually generate a lot of funding. So as soon as as soon as that went off to the company, I thought, well, we'll just sit back and wait for the company to um, make a lot of money and come back and ask for more. And maybe I should start another direction uh, while I'm waiting for that to happen. Because, um, you know, now that I've, I've done this, maybe I'm done. Uh, so, you know, kind of jumping Jumping in different directions, looking for funding was was one motivation for doing a lot of different things. Um, I, I guess another thing is it's just sort of my you know I think I think some researchers are really good at at dive, diving very deep and exploring uh, something just uh, you know completely. And if anything, I think that's you know one of my weaknesses is is I go for the low hanging fruit. Um, I see opportunities, and I want to go. I want to go do it and and try it. But I often, you know, don't stick with it quite long enough. I, a good example of this, uh, I, I meant to mention this in my talk, is uh, you know I showed this uh, style classifier, right? So that was 1998, uh, a couple of years before uh, Izmir uh, conferences started up, and. Um, uh, and it was before any genre classification studies had been published or, or even attempted. So if only I had had the, the, uh, uh, the acumen to, rather than feeding in, you know, some jazz trumpet features, uh, feeding in some simple acoustic features from rock, jazz, country music, uh, for example, then I could have built a, you know, I could have had the, the seminal paper on genre classification uh, for this this whole field uh, that you know drove Izmir for about five or ten years, but 
um, but you know, I didn't think about it. I just, I did it. I did my piece. I published a paper and moved on. So, um, uh, you know, if, if anyone's worried about sticking with, with one topic, I, I don't, I don't think that's a, a bad thing to do that, you know, that may take you to, uh, uh, doing some much more important work. Thank you. Maybe the last question is, you know, nowadays we see way more papers than 10 years ago, at least 20 years ago. Um, and I know many students feel get lost in such, you know, a bombard of different ideas and papers. And would you share your experience on selecting topics and how to select valuable topics and directions? Yeah, I'll, I, I will say um, when, when I was getting into the field, it was actually popular, uh, actually possible to read everything. <laughs> So, and, and I did, I read, um, you know, up, up until a certain, a certain year, I, I don't know when that would be, prob probably some, sometime in the 80s. Um, I, I read every paper on computer music uh, that there was. And, uh, and so that's, you know, one piece of advice is do a lot of reading and because that's where, I think that's where ideas come from that um, uh, you're reading stuff, trying to understand it and sooner or later, and probably sooner, you're gonna read something that somebody did and say, wow, that is just really a half-baked way to do things. I, you know, if, if, um, if only they applied this XYZ technique or, or they did this five years ago before this new algorithm or this uh, new concept was introduced. So what if I took, you know, this concept I just read about in paper A and, and applied it to the problem in paper B, I bet that would work. And so, you know, I, I really think um, read as much as you can and, and ideas will just come to you. Um, but how to deal with the, the flood of papers, like there's no way um, I think anyone can, can read everything that's, that's out there um, or even, even in, a, in a sub area, it's just, it's very hard to keep up with. And, and this is something, you know, I, I was never required to do um, uh, when I was kind of learning to, learning to do research and, and coming up in, in research. And so it's it's not some it's not a problem that I've I've mastered or have, you know. I should ask young people like, how do you survive? Because uh, they could probably teach me something. Okay, I we got a new question. Uh, I guess that will be the last one. Um, the new question is from Rui Yang. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Roger. As interactive systems are used in real performance and become more complex. How much understanding and proficiency in music instrument performance do you think is needed to conduct research in this direction? That's a good question. I, in, in my life, um, I feel like every, almost everything I've done has been, uh, uh, inspired by my experience as a musician and a composer. Um, I think that first, first of all, uh, being a musician and trying to make music um, is, is really important for um, selecting real problems. Uh, you know, computer, yeah, a simple, simple example. Um, where, did, where did computer accompaniment come from? Well. I was, um, I went to a talk and someone was talking about um, some sensors for, uh, for conducting. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting idea that, all right, you could have a, a computer um, sensing the motion of a baton and extracting the beat. And, and then you could build this, you know, interactive conducting system. But, but then I thought, you know, in my, experience at playing trumpet in an orchestra, um, 
I don't follow the conductor. None of the musicians don't really follow conductors. I mean, that, it's just sort of a, a myth that this guy up in front waving his baton is actually establishing the beat for everyone. And it's, it's not quite that simple. And, and I'm kind of making fun of conductors. And I, I, you know, my point is not to offend conductors, but, but conductors all know, and, and I've done interviews of conduct and studies of conductors and ask them, you know, what are you doing? And um, most of the time, they're not actually setting the beat for, for performers. And so with that musical knowledge, I was then able to say, well, hey, that's interesting. If I'm not following the conductor, what is going on? And then I realized, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to other players and I'm anticipating what's, what's going to happen based and I'm trying to synchronize with other players. So maybe I could get a computer to synchronize to another player instead of instead of conducting and and then i started thinking about comparing sequences and diff and you know and that led me to dynamic programming and solving this for real time and you know and pretty soon i had an accompaniment system that uh, was amazing people and so you know that's that's kind of a, a direct translation of musical experience into a research problem so it really helps um, and I, I'm not sure what to do, you know, if you don't have that musical musical experience, um, certainly studying some music is is probably a good idea and, and helpful. Or follow an advisor who is a musician. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, just in case people don't know, uh, uh, Gus is, is quite a musician and, uh, um, and I, I think that's where um, uh, a lot of, of his work comes from, too. All right. Uh, do we have more questions, everyone? OK. Uh, if no more questions, uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Roger, again. Uh, so the plan is, uh, maybe I'll just take this time to announce or to you know uh, to answer some clarification questions. So please uh, you know keep an eye on our schedule. So the plan is roughly thirteen hours later, uh, Roger will come back again and take another Q. Uh, you know the the purpose is to maximize the number of attendees can you know, join this interaction. And before that, we will just uh, simply replay the talk Roger gave today. Okay, so that's on the keynote. And, and our next keynote is you know, uh, about 24 hours later. So tomorrow, uh, we'll be done the Bitcoin. Um, what's more? Oh, and for papers, uh, all the presenta presentation videos, posters, PDFs, pop-ups, they are actually all online publicly. And Slack is for interaction and Q and A's. So, so this is the main, you know, logic uh, behind the design. And except for music track, every individual submission, every individual work has their own channel. Uh, when you first join the Slack, the control is very concise. It's, you just see paper poster one to six and keynotes and you know, workshop installation, but those individual tracks, they are hidden and you can find their channel number on our web website or you can just browse the channel. And music channel is a little bit different and uh, it use a very centralized control and because everything will be broadcast there. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And uh, I'll see you uh, in your time tomorrow morning. Right, right. All right. And uh, uh, let me just say uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. And I'll be um, attending the conference and giving a, a I've, I've got a, a presentation to give tomorrow. And, um, uh, and I'll, I'll be attending lots of, uh, uh, of the paper sessions. Uh, I think there's some great, as I can say, as, as co-chair of, of papers, that we've got a lot of great papers. I hope you, you all enjoy them. And um, I'll look for you on Slack and see you around. See you. All right. Hello, everyone.
Thank you, Gus. Thank you, Roger. Uh, so now the real Roger is back. And uh, everyone, <laughs> please feel free. Yeah, I want to point out it's, it's daylight now <laughs> for, for me. <laughs> and now I have the dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everyone, please feel free to raise questions using the Q&A function is uh, in the menu bar. Uh, yeah, and uh, I will be helping Roger pick up questions. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, hope you enjoyed it and, and let's uh, have some discussion. Uh, Laurel, uh, I, I saw a raise hand. Do you want to raise question or even? How can I help? <laughs> All right. So, so maybe I can fill the gap and um, ask the question that I want to ask is, yeah, performance is very hard to model. And, um, and if we, you know, in a, in a context of jazz, you know, performance is not only performance, it's composition and performance. And if we add timber control inside this picture, then is sound, motion control, and score. Um, usually, uh, I see a lot of research that go the way that uh, model these three modalities individually. And it seems, um, according to your talk, I mean, the real kind of professional way, a good way is to model it in a whole. So how do you see the trend and, and the future of it? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really important and a really difficult problem. You know, as, as researchers, we tend to uh, focus in and, and try to go deep on problems by sometimes making toy problems that just uh, exclude all of the other concerns and focus on one thing. And I, I've, I've always tried to at least work on, on uh, problems that are, are real in the sense that solving the problems would enable you, for example, to go out and give a live concert. Um, or produce a real piece of music, as opposed to just writing a, a research paper. Um, uh, but yeah, but that's but but integrating these things is a problem. And and another thing that uh, came up in sort of a follow up to to last night's uh, talk uh, is is the idea that um, w when we work on interactive systems, we usually focus. Uh, not only on a particular problem, but on a particular time scale. And really, in, in performance, humans are operating at many, many different time scales from, you know, the uh, microsecond uh, sound and acoustics and DSP level, all the way up to planning and composition. So uh, an, an example is back in the um, in transit piece, I played with the style uh, recognition, uh, yeah, there was a, a, a delay or a latency of, of up to five seconds or even longer to identify um, style transitions. But within any performance, uh, the, the, um, you know, the artificial performers were, were reacting on a, a note by note level and there was even some signal processing. So we're interacting at, a, at an acoustic level. And I think that's you know that's a gross simplification of what happens when humans perform, but it's but it's a, it's an example of uh, how systems can work at, at many different time granularities, and so I think you know integrating integrating the different scales of time and integrating uh, compositional planning with uh, sound production and and performance uh, expressive performance uh, the, those those big system integration problems are, are really difficult and, you know, a great challenge for researchers in the future. Oh, thank you. That's, that's very deep thought that, you know, the three levels of fermentation are actually happening on three different timescales and, and most research, you know, 
um, of course, as the first step, we can just focus on one time scale and do the work, but eventually it is a very complex hierarchy. Uh, next question uh, is uh, from Laura. Uh, yesterday, in the critical perspectives on AI, we discussed the issue of whether it is ethical to re-perform someone's music without their express permission. Do you think <laughs> it, there is ethical issues around trying to recreate Gary Kershaw's fitting? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, certainly there are. Um, uh, I, I think you know these are these are social problems. There are legal problems and copyright problems, and um, I I think uh, yeah I don't know. I, I I was about to say um, the the technical challenge is so uh, interesting and abstract uh, that and it's 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 going to evolve and get looked at anyway. That I I don't really have any any problem with pursuing the research. It's it's when you when you get down to choosing a particular person to model who might not even be with us anymore, and uh, you know who gets to make that decision and and who shares in the in the credit and the result and you know possible profits commercialization, um, those those all become really difficult issues. And so th thanks for bringing that up and. Uh, Sorry, I don't have, have a great uh, simple answer for any of that. Uh, next question is from Jackson. Uh, great presentation. I want to ask if you could explain further uh, what you mean by better machine listening during Jerry's project. Do you mean through better audio separation? If so, what are the essential elements you believe we could need for the reincarnation of a Jerry's performance. Will we need visual data as well? Uh, well, yeah, so in, in that case, uh, the immediate bearer, uh, barrier is uh, source separation. Um, if, you know, there are thousands of hours of recordings, uh, but if you go to those recordings and you wanna know um, at, a, at a note level or gestural level, what was Jerry Garcia playing? Um, you know, we we just don't have any way to get get that data directly. So, so certainly, uh, uh, source separation or transcription um, are you know top top of the list for barriers in machine listening. I I'm also thinking beyond that. Um, there, you know, the problems I, I pointed out um, as current challenges, the, uh, the problem of, of beat tracking is really difficult. And, you know, I kind of suspect, I'm, I'm not really sure how uh, competent humans are at beat tracking. And I think there's, there's room for a lot of interesting study of, of performers and listeners. Uh, I know when I'm, when I'm listening, um, I, I get a sense of where the beat is, but I'm, I'm not always totally confident. And sometimes you don't really quite understand what's going on um, until later, uh, or you hear a piece and, and uh, kind of don't realize whether it's, um, you know, a hemiola or it's actually in three, four or what's going on. And, and after a couple of hearings, you say, oh yeah, I, I see it now. And then the, the way the brain works, you have we have this kind of categorical perception where once once it locks in and and we know that it's three four, we have a hard time even imagining that we ever heard the beat any other way. Um, so I, I think there's maybe humans are a little bit overconfident about how well they hear the beat. But on the other hand, you know performers do play, and if if they do get lost, um, uh, which which I know you know happens. From time to time, uh, or, or lose the sense of the beat, uh, we we recapture it very quickly, uh, so well that that you know in jazz performances the audience never knows uh, what's what's going on, and so so those higher levels of music listening, um, understanding form, understanding beat, understanding where bar lines, you know, learning uh, to detect uh, uh, bar lines and 
uh, key sig uh, time signature. Uh, well, and then and then you know understanding harmony and key signatures and all all of that is also very difficult. We, we've been doing some work on um, both both audio and symbolic uh, chord labeling, and it's it's really a, a difficult problem, and it's it's not one that that humans do perfectly, but it seems like we're still at the point where we can we can label stuff by hand with. Uh, much more accuracy, you know. We get we get machines to to do chord labeling, and then we go through by hand and fix it. So, you know, I think we feel pretty confident that we're doing a lot better than machines. Uh, so, so you know, all, all sorts of areas where machine listening could be improved. First done by AI and then fix it, just like our live captioning sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's very interesting to, to you know when we think about this machine listening involves so many layers. There are acoustic layers and uh, music knowledge layers, and you know essentially perceptual and cognitive layers. And when you speak of um, beat tracking, it just occurred to me that most beat tracking system kind of only focus on the acoustic features. And human are able to recognize the beat, uh, say for classical music, purely based on a pitch contour, and this is truly amazing. And uh, no model, can, no model can do it so far. Seems to be right. I, I think it ties in a lot with source separation. That I, I really feel like if if we did better source separation, we could do much better uh, beat tracking. Um, because a, a lot of the errors that beat trackers seem to make uh, seems to come from, uh, you know, just glomming together all these different sources into, into one spectrum or into spectral bands. And uh, we get a lot of noise and interference because that energy comes from different instruments doing totally different things. Uh, our next question is from Nicholas Gold. Great talk, Roger, many thanks. How close do you think we are to machine performers having their own recognizable musical identity in performance rather than being good models of existing or former human musicians? This might just be a restatement of the general AI grand challenge, but is there a step beyond modeling perhaps? Yeah, hi Nicholas. Uh, thanks for that question. I I think um, uh, there there might be a, a kind of a, a very simple way in in which uh, machines could have a distinctive style without really being intelligent, and and that comes from um, you know a lot of work in algorithmic composition uh, involves composers creating algorithms that generate music, but maybe not through deep musical knowledge, but just through through algorithms, you, you know, uh, sonifying the digits of pi or something. And and the stuff that gets generated in, it generated in that way uh, can have a, a very distinctive sound. And that's the attraction uh, to a large extent for, for composers is that um, uh, by taking algorithmic approaches, you can produce stuff that you never really imagined uh, you would you would hear. Uh, you can't even imagine what it's going to sound like when you write the when you write the code or, or when you write the bugs that turn out to sound better than the, the code you meant to write. And so all of those things are, are I think are good examples of um, sort of human computer uh, collaborative creativity. Um, uh, that, that result in you know really new and interesting things. So so certainly I think we can build performers and maybe just because they have bugs and they don't understand everything, they they might you know take on some really interesting characteristics. Um, you know just to <laughs> kind of poke fun at at uh, techno and drum machines. Um, you know when drum machines came out, there was this whole new music kind of based around the 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 really uh, super stable and kind of sterile sound of, of drum machines, but it was taken as, as a feature. Um, uh, but it was, you know, a really new style, like no drummer ever, ever sounded like a digital drum machine. 
Uh, and, and so in that sense, we had, we had kind of virtual performers, you know, back in the seventies. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one example. And, uh, um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks. Um, next question I'll pick up is from Derek. Um, he asked, all the performance models you have shown are based on asking the computer to imitate the actions of a live musician in a fairly traditional manner. In the 1960s, Wendy Carlos demonstrated supposedly futuristic possibilities of um, analog electronic synthesis by playing music from the 18th century. <laughs> While the imitation of previously accepted musical form is certainly a rewarding engineering challenge, is it a real indicator of the possibilities for creating new music using new technology? Uh, what about creating music which embodies the uniqueness of the machine over the imitation of the human? Wow. Yeah, uh, I, I think about this a lot. This is this is a, a good question, and um, you know, to, on, on the one hand, I think that. Um, these, uh, you know, the, this early slide I put up, the dream of computer music, saying that that all music basically is about making sound, organizing sound, and and performing. Uh, that seems to hold up pretty well over, uh, uh, you know, all the way from early music to um, uh, you know, twentieth and twenty first century. Uh, experimental music and electronic music. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel so bad about about um, you know continuing to explore these directions. Um, I guess the the one thing that I would I would point to um, in the things that I I talked about is uh, my my notion of interactive systems. Um, being a sort of a new form of music notation or an alternative to traditional music notation where the, the composer can sort of embed um, affordances for interactions within a piece in order to accomplish some compositional goal um, while freeing up the performer to um, uh, stop reading notes and just play and, and improvise and interact with that system. So I, you know, I think I think that is is really a new thing that could only come about through composition. It never existed before, and you know, composers experimented with aleatoric music and chance music uh, um, uh, for decades in the 20th century, and um, and yet I I and and great music was created. So and that was considered, you know, very leading edge and revolutionary. And I, I think computation has enabled us to extend that um, even further, you know, beyond chance and aleatoric music into um, actual uh, sort of compositional theory and direction, uh, much more like like notation into interactive systems. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, another ethical one uh, from Hans. Roger, thanks a lot for your presentation. I was wondering, how do you think about the possibility of using AI to real-time lay interpretation features on the playing of other musicians, probably using prediction? Think about uh, think of the phrasing of Clifford Brown, uh, superimposed life on a modern day trumpet player. Uh, and indeed, is that ethical? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, um, that's a really uh, interesting thought to um, sort of build hybrid performances that uh, combine, um, you know, phrasing or, or articulation or sound um, uh, and, and, and sort of transferring elements of style from one performer to another. Um, you know, I, I think in music, um, anything goes. And I, I, 
uh, you know, music has always been based on um, building on the styles of others. You know, with, without Mozart, we wouldn't have have Beethoven. Um, and and you know, was that unethical for for Beethoven to begin writing in classical style? That you know, I think. <clears throat> um, uh, or, or you know, you could you could name all sorts of composers that influence other composers and and um, and their work is adapted and, and certain and we see the same thing in in pop music and you know commercial music of all kinds and jazz the whole tradition of jazz you know where would Clifford Brown be without Louis Armstrong uh, even though there's you know it's it's a it's it's a big change and and you know we could name a number of uh, trumpet players in between them uh, that all all contributed uh, to to what Clifford Brown played so. Uh, so yeah, I, I I think that's it's all up for grabs, and um, you know I think we have to be careful and maybe maybe acknowledge uh, sources, especially especially when you know if we're actually taking recordings of one artist and either either sampling or analyzing, um, that seems a little different than just listening to them. But but I'm not sure that it's all that all that different. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a related issue I can think of is, is copyright issue. The, the current law of copyright issue is uh, if you copy the whole phrase or whatever amount of notes, but um, we have already seen a whole bunch of literature about the so-called music style transfer coming in. And of course, not the whole system style transfer is either a compositional style transfer, performance style, we see a relatively less and you know, acoustic, you know, timbre style transfer. And when, the, when we have style transfer come in, it's kind of, it's very difficult to define the copyright issue. It's, it seems it's a, it's a new area. Yeah, uh, copyright. Uh, <laughs> there's there are many ethical issues around around copyright as well. I'm 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 not a big I I, I guess I'm a, a fan of a, a very limited copyright as it existed, uh, for example, in the early U.S. law. But but lately, um, you know, the extension of expansion of copyright and and internationalization, and uh, I I think that's um, uh, you know, not itself is is not uh, particularly ethical or uh, you know oriented towards society and culture. So, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is taking the machine learning approach and assuming that we agree or standardize what performance associated data is what, how, when to capture, at least for each instrument category. Do you think that there is sufficient consistency across performers that allow to merge data from different performers in a database used to train a model? If not, we need to take a performance specific approach which may limit it, the applicability um, because it's not easy for a performer to generate thousands of hours of data. Uh, yeah, I think this this points to some real problems in machine learning uh, that uh, at, at least, you know, now the uh, use of deep networks re tends to require lots and lots of data. And, um, you know, the conventional wisdom is the more data, the better. And the problem is that if, if you uh, when you look at, at lots and lots of data, uh, these systems tend to sort of um, uh, average the data and, and smear it together. So um, let me talk about trumpet because I, I, can, I can think, uh, you know, I have a personal connection to that. Um, if, if I have data from a lot of different trumpet players, well, some trumpet players just, you know, have a brighter sound or they were recorded um, uh, more, more brightly. And so uh, others, others are going to have a, a kind of more dark and mellow sound. And if, and if you try to learn, like, what does a trumpet sound like 
by mixing all of these different things together, um, you know, the result that you get is is probably not. I mean, well, yeah, it's probably not going to be uh, very good, and um, because it's it's going to, uh, you know, not really understand what's going on, and and so it would be, you know, much much better if we could learn. Um, uh, somehow, uh, uh, you know, if we can provide context of, well, this is, uh, this is Clifford Brown and this is Miles and this is Maynard Ferguson, you know, very different, just to pick some very different sounds, then, um, uh, you know, maybe if, if learning systems can, can take that identity into effect, they might do a better job. But um, so in, in my work, uh, uh, we've, uh, um, our instrument modeling has been based on single players. Uh, so, and, and if you do that, you tend to get very, cons and, and also a single recording situation. You know, we very carefully say, okay, I'm going to put uh, the microphone 18 inches from the bell and um, uh, with this particular microphone, because, uh, you know, if you just mix up microphones or you record from, directly close in front of the bell versus to the side, you get a very different spectrum. And uh, it's almost like having two different players. So um, anyway, if, if you have one player, one recording setup, uh, one instrument, then you tend to get uh, very consistent data. So um, uh, you, can, you can actually overfit to that, to that data and it's okay because you're just gonna end up sounding like that player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, thanks. And you know, this reminds me of uh, the transfer learning technique, emotional learning. And uh, yeah. you, we all know the so-called uh, pre-training and fine-tuning. So there's uh, maybe possibility to you know pre-train a general performance model, what uh, almost everyone do, and then fine-tune it across different performers. But but still, that you know, I, I guess the point here is. For music, we have way less data compared to at least com computer vision, not mentioning NLP. Uh, so, well, you know, big data, the, tr the transformation from big data to small data is, is well, all, all machine learning researchers want to achieve this. And then maybe music is, is the starting point for this because we have less data and maybe this will make us good uh, you know, this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to think that when we're listening to, um, when we're listening to music to a particular performer or whatever, we're always forming predictions. And, and so we're, uh, you know, we're sort of running classifiers saying, oh, this guy sounds kind of like that, or this guy's playing a really bright sounding lead trumpet sound. So I'm going to expect everything else to sound like that. And, and I think that kind of, of uh, expectation and um, kind of temporal consistency, it gets lost in, in most machine learning where, where you just you know, chop up the data into feature vectors and feed it all in with no, with no uh, temporal prediction or identity uh, associated with it. And so you know, maybe I, I think there must be other, other ways of learning and, and scheduling learning to um, to do a, a better job. Yeah. Uh, we got a follow up question from Nicholas. Might we end up building models of produce sound because we are using recordings in most cases in our training data rather than live playing and mistake one for the other as an authentic representation of the musicians concerned. And is this avoidable or even a problem, do you think? Yeah, that's, uh, 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 thanks for that question, Nicholas. That's uh, great. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm reminded of, uh, I've, I've just been working on uh, recording uh, uh, some jazz pieces with a, a friend because we've both been uh, pretty much in, in isolation and we thought, uh, let's just let's make some recordings and send them back and forth. And uh, I was uh, um, 
unhappy, you know, with everything I recorded, I guess because it's in a recording situation and not a live one, everything I recorded, I was kind of unhappy with. So I started uh, just editing um, the stuff I had, re you know, taking the, the good bits of and, and putting things together and, um, uh, and, and doing, you know, a lot of manipulation. And I ended up with something that I, I felt like, you know, wow, if I had actually played that, I'd be <laughs> extremely happy. Like it sounds, I sound better than ever. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, so, so what's wrong with that? Sounding good is, is good. So, um, uh, you know, so now I have this, this produced sound that I think, uh, you know, conceivably I could have played it. And if I was a much greater player, I, I might even play that. And, and so, you, you know, I guess I kind of hope people will <laughs> mistake this <laughs> produced sound for, for live, you know, quote, authentic sound. Uh, but um, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a, a very interesting phenomenon in, in modern recording that, you know, the early recordings were, were trying to sound like live uh, music and, and they were recorded in that way. Um, then when, when people started, uh, had, had more ability to produce in the studio, uh, you know, why wouldn't you fix things and try to try to make things, uh, more interesting, elaborate. I, I mean, think back to, uh, like some of the, the studio work that the Beatles did, it was kind of like this whole new, uh, new thing to hear this wild stuff uh, and a total change from the you know early early Beatles live performance and live recordings and so um, yeah and so and so then we got to the place where people were actually trying to reproduce on stage what they produced in the studio and and we we see we hear people um, you know uh, uh, standard equipment in in writers for lots of performers is auto-tune you know running running live to uh fix their intonation um because they think it makes them sound better or that's the sound that they want so we're moving you know this produced sound into live performance and i think a lot of what i talked about like like getting that that beautiful string orchestra on stage with the jazz band is, is an example of, you know, we ended up with something that we could have only done in the studio, but we were doing it live. And, and so I, th I think that's all, all good. Yeah, this reminds me that, you know, for Ning's thesis, uh, actually you didn't show the trumpet demo to my ear, maybe because I'm not a trumpist. The trumpet demo are actually even better than the bassoons. And the only way I can tell either this played by you or it's generated by the model, if it's new piece, is the computer generated sound is, is too perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although, you know, um, uh... I know and I've worked with trumpet players that they can play that perfectly and, and uh, that's a, a funny thing about these these computer gen well first of all let me let me back up and say the, the reason I did not play the trumpet stuff is all, all of the trumpet uh, generation that we've produced um, has has kind of a, an overfitting and tweaking problem that we um, you know we, we built all these algorithms to model the trumpet and we listened to it and if there was something we didn't like, we'd go back and we'd fix the model. So there's there's a real risk that we were, um, uh, th that the quality that you hear is is due to hand tweaking and not to the techniques themselves. So the the bassoon technique was was really honest because um, we developed all of the algorithms for trumpet, and then and then I told I told Ning you have to do this. Um, we're going to put bassoon into this model. And and just hear what it comes up with. And uh, even though it was like tuned for trumpet, it should have should you know our claim was this should generalizes. So let's just see. And and I, I think given that it's really amazing. You know if, if we did another month or two of work on um, with a trying out a bunch of different woodwinds and tweaking the woodwind performance and so on, then uh, it would sound even better. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say about about the the trumpet playing is, 
there's this thing probably all instrumentalists in the uh, that are listening will identify with this that um, you know whatever instrument you play if you hear someone else play that instrument you you just kind of instantly you know it, it grabs your brain and, and you want to check that that instrumentalist out and say like um, you know I mean there are jokes about guitar players uh, how many how many guitar players does it take to screw in a light bulb? Um, you know, 10, it takes one to screw in the light bulb and nine to say, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> and so that idea of uh, there's, a, you know, just an edge of competitiveness or comparing and rating yourself in terms of how you play. And, and uh, every time I hear this uh, uh, computer generated trumpet, you know, sort of playing with my sound and my phrasing, but doing it just like absolutely perfectly, it, it always turns my head and I, I, I get this like really gut level feeling of who is that guy? Like, <laughs> and, and, and that's, why, that's why I feel like this, you know, I knew I'd really accomplish something if I could actually be jealous of my own uh, uh, computer sound synthesis compared to my real acoustic playing. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a great story and maybe also a good point to um, finish the second Q&A session. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, thank you. And thanks yeah. for everyone for, for coming and I'll, I'll be around. I'll, I'll see you at the conference. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>